Welcome, everybody. Uh, in the morning, if you're on the American side, in Europe in the afternoon, and if you're in Asia somewhere, evening, late evening. Uh, we're in the this series on VS Code AL extensions, the third session. And today, my guest will be James Pearson, Martin Sagi, and yes, myself. Um, I'm very thankful, James and Martin, that you joined in on this one, like the previous uh, presenters did uh, on the uh, session one and two. Today, we'll uh, have a look at uh, the test runner, the AL test runner by James, uh, the AL Studio extension of Martin, which is a, a huge one. So his challenge was uh, to make a, a, a reasonable selection to uh, for the approximately 20 minutes we reserved for him. And uh, I will be presenting the ATD test scripter, by the way, and I will mention that later. I started it somehow, but Martin had a big share in it, like also uh, David uh, Feldhoff. Um, but before we go into that, of course, uh, in this series, I uh, reserved some room to show you all the extensions that are part of it. The next slide, by the way, is a bit better. This is the, this the planning in order of the session. So we're halfway and uh, uh, James Martins and, and let's say my uh, extension will be presented today. And then next week we'll have the last session in this series showing the extensions from Rob, uh, Johannes and uh, Christoph. Um, if you have any other AL extension but uh, there are well these are the most uh, the biggest group there are a couple of others that uh, for example from uh, uh, Stefan Maron um, but uh, while he might be presenting it somewhat later the uh, AL Linter and there is also a very nice one uh, that is about uh, uh, modeling uh, using a model to program to get your code in shape but uh, we'll get back to that later maybe and i have an additional slide at the end of this introduction please if you want to be uh, interacting with us use the go to webinar question window because your microphone is muted and we're not going to unmute that and i will be picking up the questions we uh, have set up let's say we agreed upon that in between handing over from one presenter to the other you uh, your questions will be picked up if there is a more or less urgent question that relates to something that needs to be handled at that point i will pick it up too uh, and then pose it while somebody's presenting but preferably we'll try to do it let's say from handing off from one to the other and then at the end of the uh, session um of course you might know already but just also for the recording and for those who joined in first time uh, this will be recorded the recording is running already and uh, will be placed on our uh, channel on YouTube. As you can see, we have, uh, well, this, this is a nice number, but we have already uh, 37 recorders. Today's session 38. And as you can see, the first one was viewed a lot of time. Uh, apparently the second one, I don't know. There is uh, also interesting information in the second one. <laughs> Promote it to uh, anybody you know. If you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, this is the link to do so. Um, and uh, we'll update you after every time. And uh, well, it was last week we sent out uh, the newsletter because uh, next to that, the session four will be played next, next week. On July 6th, we'll have Mark Brommel back in town, if I would put it that way. Long time ago that Mark Brommel did uh, a webinar on a topic, of course, Mark Brommel is the, uh, the well, I just would say it, uh, more or less the uh, uh, founder to Ariopa webinars. He started with my skills webinars and I joined him on that. And when he wanted to back off, let's say we moved into Ariopa webinars. So I'm happy to have him on the show in uh, July. That will probably be the last one before the summer recession, although two weeks later on the 20th, I'm still at home probably, so um, if anybody has a topic, uh, be welcome to suggest one, to suggest a topic or more, or be yourself a speaker if you want to. Uh, there are some ideas on next topics. Uh, we had some discussions while we were preparing for this series on the AL VS Code extension. Uh, somebody came up 
with what do you do exactly in your daily development uh, setup? Uh, how do you use Docker, etc.? So that might be a, a nice topic of people joining in on a kind of panel, whatever. And uh, let's say appeal to any of you present now or uh, playing this recording. If you have any non-ALVS code extension you're using and uh, want to uh, get them demoed, uh, get more insight, or you want to be demoing it, feel free to, to let us know. I think uh, the small things are as important as the bigger things. So we could have big stories on how you should do your test automation better or efficiently, but those small things are really worthwhile. By the way, uh, thinking of, or while talking, I'm thinking of uh, uh, the thing that uh, uh, David Feldhoff has added to his AL uh, code actions. Uh, two new features introduced last week. Really worthwhile. Have a look at that. So I'm finished with the introduction. A little bit more than uh, otherwise. It would be four or five minutes or six minutes. Um, I'm going to hand off to James before I do thanks to Fornaf to enable us to do this. So James, I'm going to make you presenter and then uh, I can tell you if I see your screen and can hear you well enough. Yeah, okay. your, sc Excellent. Your, screen. Yeah, your screen is up and okay. I can hear you. Okay, great. Well, hello everyone. Um, let me tell you briefly then what uh, AL Test Runner is all about. It, it began really with um, I wanted to keep my context in Visual Studio Code. Um, if you're using the standard AL test tool page in the web client to run your test, then you'll find yourself flicking constantly between Visual Studio Code and the web client and back again. And really, I, I wanted to write and run and debug the tests in VS Code. That, that was really the goal. Um, and when it became possible to run tests from PowerShell uh, in Freddy's uh, container helper module, um, that was really the starting point to, um, to get going with this. Uh, so yeah, the main features to write, run, and debug tests. Um, but also, once you've brought the context back into VS Code, then that gives you nice possibilities like, well, let's store the results uh, as part of the project, and that allows you to decorate the code. Uh, so there's an example of a failing test where the line that led to the error is highlighted, and you can hover over that line and get the call stack. Um, and then obviously that's persisted uh, in your workspace. Um, and most recently uh, added uh, a bit of code coverage uh, capability as well. So that's what I'm going to be uh, talking about for the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, this is me. If you don't know who I am, uh, I'm James. I work for Noric as a solution architect. Um, and we do, among other things, software for the beverage industry. So um, if you are someone who both likes software and drinking things, then uh, that could be perfect for you. So give it a look at drinkit.com. Uh, enough about me and on to sharing view. The extension. Uh, so I've got a very simple app here. What the app does doesn't matter too much for the purposes of the demo. Um, just for your interest, I, I quite like to work in two editors like this with the, the production code on the left-hand side and the corresponding test code on the right, because uh, normally I'm trying to do test-driven development and write the tests and run them while I'm writing the production code. So let me just start this test running. Uh, you'll see the extension recognizes a test method and adds code lens uh, actions, run test and debug test. Also at the top of the code unit, you can run all the tests uh, in the code unit or indeed debug all the tests. When I choose to run a test, um, there's a bit of config in a JSON file, which I, uh, I won't look at now for the sake of time, but that stores the credentials and the Docker host and the Docker container that we're going to run the tests against. And it comes back with the result 
of the test. In this case, it's a fail. So the uh, the procedure is decorated in a uh, in a red. You can customize the color if you prefer something different, and shows the line that led to the error. And again, hovering over that line gives you the call stack that led to the error. So in, in this case, the error is expected because um, I haven't yet gone and done the uh, the work that's going to make the test pass. Uh, this is something to do with adding an order origin code to a sales order, um, which takes a default value from a customer. Uh, so then I'd, I'd write the production code and come back to my test. When you run it, um, there's an option to determine, do you want to automatically publish that um, test app into the container again, which normally I do want to do that, uh, but it's optional. You can do a rapid publish, a standard publish or, or do nothing, in which case you'd publish it manually first. And now the test passes. You can see the, the highlighting has changed to green. The, the failure line uh, highlighting is gone. So that's you know, the, the very basic functionality. You run the test, see it fail, run it again, and see it pass. Um, I've got another test uh, as an example down here, which is going to fail. Because uh, occasionally it's useful to be able to debug the tests as well. In fact, I, I tend to find uh, writing a test is the easiest way to find the bug or to to reproduce the bug uh, if the customer or the consultant or whoever has raised the bug with you has given you some steps. It's when I create a sales order and I validate this field, uh, I find it's at least as quick to to replicate that in a test as it is to um, to do it in the client. So let's say uh, I want to investigate this uh, failing test now. So I'll set a breakpoint and I will choose to debug the test. That's going to go to my launch configurations and find uh, a configuration of type attach and attach the debugger. It's then going to call a web service to run that test. And as you can see, uh, it's broken on the breakpoint. And now off we go, we can step into the code and see what's happening, allow it to run um, and see this is the, the test field that is causing the error and investigate the call stack, do all the, the usual stuff that you'd want to do uh, when you're debugging that test. And that will come back with the, the error that was encountered. Uh, and again, I've already uh, prepared the solution. So I'd find the bug and fix it, hopefully, and then come back and rerun the test. And then uh, you see it pass. You'll see the, the decoration on the test name change and the, uh, the highlighting will be removed. Cool. Uh, so you can run individual tests um, with the code lens actions. There's also a uh, few commands that are added. Uh, you can run all tests in the, in the entire project. You can just run the current test, which is what I've been doing or you can run all the tests in the current code unit, uh, whatever you prefer. So if I run all the tests in the current code unit, uh, I've got the setting that enables code coverage switched on uh, in the e extension settings. Again, I won't go into how you configure that and uh, how you get that working for the sake of time now. I've blogged a little bit about that, but you're you're welcome to uh, to get in touch if you're you're struggling to set that up. Um, so five tests and uh, they all ran, and you get a little summary of the code coverage statistics down the bottom. Code coverage stats come with a little bit of a health warning, I think. Um, I wouldn't make a certain percentage 
a target for your code coverage necessarily, um, but it can be a useful indicator of parts of your code base that might need a little bit more work. So as an example here, I've only got 13% uh, in the order origin table, uh, which is being hit by my tests. So that might be worthwhile for me to, to go and have a look at. Uh, I've got the path to the file, the source file here. Uh, so you can alt click in the output window to navigate to that file. And there is a command to uh, show uh, if I could remember what my own command is called, there is a toggle code coverage and you can toggle that on and it will highlight lines of code which were hit by the previous test run. So code coverage is not cumulative, it's not persisted between runs, um, it's always related to the previous run. Uh, so I, I've got some nonsense code here just just to demonstrate, but uh, I might then look at code coverage and see what well, none of this code is actually being hit by any of my tests. It might be worthwhile me going to uh, to have a look. Uh, so, in a in a nutshell, uh, that is it. Um, there's various different development scenarios. Uh, I'm both local for VS Code and the Docker host, just running Docker Desktop. Uh, you can have local VS Code against a remote Docker host, as long as you enable PS Remoting, or you can do remote VS Code development with VS Code Server um, instead. Things that aren't supported or at least uh, limited, it doesn't work against a non-Docker installation of Business Central, it doesn't work against SaaS, and if you're using Windows authentication in your Docker container, um, you will probably run into one or two limitations. Um, I haven't tested it very rigorously with Windows authentication um, because I don't use it myself. A few ideas for the future. Um, I watched the, the launch party for VS Code 1.57 um, yesterday and they are bringing in a new API for a test explorer um, which will be native in, uh, in VS Code, you'll be able to see a tree of all the tests and their results. Um, that's still in preview at the moment, but I expect I'll, um, I'll have a look at trying to uh, integrate with that. Uh, maybe some improvements to code coverage, some more statistics or uh, overview. Maybe make it a little bit easier to set up. Um, I know it's, it's a little bit clunky at the moment with the config file and different settings. Um, and if there's anything else, it's open source, it's on GitHub, so feel free to um, to open a pull request and, uh, and contribute uh, all suggestions and, uh, and ideas, more than welcome. So that's me done, Luke. Great, no questions uh, posed here, so I don't have anything to, uh, to ask you at the moment, and I don't have a question. I've been working with it for a while already, yes. Still need to tackle the, the, the code coverage, which I uh, didn't get working, but uh, <laughs> I'll know where to find you. <laughs> okay, good. So you can hand over to Martin, I think. Yeah, here we go. Hey, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? I just muted my microphone, but I can hear and see the things. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, Martin Shaggy. I uh, work at uh, eFacto uh, as a business central developer. I'm uh, also author of uh, other uh, VS Code extensions like AL Object Designer and ATDD Test Scriptor um, uh, as a co-author. Um, today I'm gonna show you AR Studio, which is, um, let's say, a, a continuation of uh, AL Object Designer and its features, uh, it's taking the previous uh, features to the next level. Um, so I can just start uh, because there is not much coding in here. Uh, mostly it's uh, visual or uh, data grid based uh, information. Um, the approach of AI Studio is uh, 
a bit holistic. Uh, I try to gather all information in one place and uh, uh, show it to the developers or consultants. Um, so the first screen uh, I have uh, is an AL home screen, uh, which is very similar to the uh, AL object designer. You can see the objects, uh, the event publishers, uh, subscribers, uh, the object types. Uh, there is uh, also an additional uh, sidebar, uh, which can be uh, hidden or moved uh, anywhere else. Um, you can uh, select your application you want to work with, and uh, there are uh, these are VS Code commands actually just uh, put in uh, uh, as uh, buttons, so you don't have to type the uh, VS Code commands uh, all the time. So actually, you can just uh, click on the start and uh, it will start up the uh, ticketing manager app with the uh, config. So it's uh, just a convenience part. You can also start the pub, uh, debugging and uh, uh, there is uh, some easier stuff for the symbol downloading and uh, the snapshot handling for the initialization and uh, finishing the snapshot itself. Okay, that's cool. I have to log in. Uh, okay, so I like that it's froze a bit. Okay, um, I just closed down the. Uh, 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 okay, sorry, it's closed down the wrong window. Um, Okay, and uh, in the object part, uh, there are also some useful information. So if you go uh, to a table or any kind of uh, object, you can see the uh, properties that are set uh, for the uh, given object. You can also click on the uh, property name and it will load in the official uh, documentation from the Microsoft site. Uh, so it's a bit easier to navigate. Um, and of course, if there is a lookup page or something related, you can click on it and uh, it will load up the uh, related designer or source, source code uh, based on configuration and uh, uh, addition. Um, you can also filter to the uh, subtype of the page or the table um, to the access level um, for the reports. Uh, you can also filter to the uh, layout. Um, there is also some uh, trick for the uh, reporting. So if you have a uh, standard uh, report, you can uh, just easily uh, access the RDRC layout from the uh, app package. So you don't have to extract uh, anything. Uh, yes, Studio will do that for you. And you can just uh, open the layout and save as uh, if you want to duplicate it uh, within the application. Uh, same goes for the word layout as well. Um, the other nice thing is uh, if you want to open up a, a table extension or a page extension, uh, it will uh, straightly go to the main object, so you don't have to. Uh, find the main object. Uh, it will also work from the extension as well. Um, on the sidebar, I also have a, a workspace view, which is uh, just your uh, local objects uh, grouped by object type. You can click on them and uh, it will load up the uh, designer or the source code if you configure that way. Um, Okay, so the uh, other uh, thing uh, I have is uh, uh, a workspace uh, wizard. Uh, you can set up uh, all your basic information uh, like the uh, workspace name, the author, uh, launch JSON settings, and uh, even if you uh, add multiple projects uh, here, all the newly created projects will have the same. Uh, launch JSON information and uh, metadata for all the applications. Um, so you can 
add the new project, uh, with a test project or without it, and when you finish it, a new workspace will be created. Uh, I won't click on it because I already have my workspace. Uh, the other thing I have uh, is a table designer. Um, you can see the list of the fields. Uh, if you click on a field, uh, you can also see all the properties. Uh, and uh, if you right click and uh, go to definition, it will load up the uh, source and navigate to the uh, appropriate uh, field. Uh, this also works for the field groups and uh, for the keys as well. So you can also do the same with the keys. Uh, there is also a trigger. Uh, or method list, you can see the methods uh, and events, publishers or subscribers to a table. You can also search for something if you want, uh, clicking uh, to the source code, if you need to do so. And uh, if uh, a table has extensions, um, uh, on the left side, you can filter to the fields which uh, belongs to the uh, selected uh, application and you can also uh, navigate to the source code of the given table extension so if i want to uh, check this uh, table extension for the ticketing reporting manager app then i can do that as well uh, very easily and so this is uh, mainly for the table uh, designer part uh, there is also a page designer, which uh, let's say uh, is the uh, work uh, with uh, Docker stuff because uh, uh, I can work without uh, Docker for most of the <laughs> parts uh, by designing a page. Uh, this uh, page view actually merged down all the page extensions. Uh, as you can see, uh, I added two uh, fields to the customer card and uh, I also have uh, this uh, text that uh, this belongs to the ticketing ticket manager application. Um, you can also go to definition from the page as well. And if you do this for the extended uh, fields, it will uh, you can go to the page extension. Uh, if you select uh, a field, you can see all the uh, properties for it and um, there is also a menu bar so you can see the uh, how your uh, action bar would look like in uh, business central um, you can click on them and it will actually navigate you to the uh, related object if it is set for a run object uh, uh, stuff and uh, one thing uh, that is also uh, supported is the translations so if you have uh, multiple translations uh, for the app you can just switch and um, you can actually check if your uh, translation works uh, properly if uh, let's say i think for the danish i don't have anything yet and uh, uh, if you miss it you can actually uh, fix it uh, right here i don't speak danish but uh, let's say I put here something and uh, this uh, text is actually uh, saved into the uh, proper XLA file. So you don't have to uh, worry about that as well. Um, one thing I have here is uh, an overview of the changes made uh, to this uh, page uh, by uh, page extensions actually. So you can see that uh, there were some control changes here. I have a uh, uh, better uh, demo for this. Uh, so for for the role center, I did uh, many changes. So actually, this uh, role center was hit by three different apps, and you can see uh, the actions I added. And yeah, I on low time, so I'm just uh, moving on. Uh, I have a, a translation overview. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, actually able to edit uh, all your uh, translations uh, using machine translation as well. Um, you can overview how you are doing. Uh, I'm not very good at the moment uh, on the overview. Uh, and on the translations, you have a, 
cumulative view of all your applications, uh, application translations, and all the languages uh, at the same place. So you don't have to uh, worry about Excel files uh, anymore. You can also filter down and uh, just say for the Danish one, I accept the uh, translation by Azure. And, uh, you can set that, okay, I set it translated and uh, you can auto translate all the other ones. Uh, and if you are happy with the other translations as well, you can set uh, all translated and you are good to go. And uh, this is actually what it, uh, what I do for translation. So for me, it uh, takes uh, minutes uh, to handle uh, changes. And you can also go to the uh, related uh, object uh, straight in the source code if you want to uh, you know, change the caption or uh, something else. Uh, you can also export uh, these uh, entries into an Excel file, which uh, actually gives you the same uh, as you can see it uh, here. Um, okay, I also have a complete overview of all of the table fields. Um, it works for the fields, groups, and keys as well. Uh, you can see uh, and select the uh, application if you want to. And uh, if you click on the name, it will navigate you to the uh, related field, key, or uh, group. So it's uh, pretty easy and uh, anything you search for you will see. You can also see the uh, obsolete uh, state, reason, and tag. So if you want to uh, search for any uh, tag or something just to see what uh, was obsoleted in the latest version, you can do so. Um, and I'm also moving on. I also have a, a search uh, view. This is a, uh, actually a cumulated search in the source code and uh, within object symbols and in object properties and uh, translations. Uh, so with this, uh, you can search for uh, basically anything uh, within the uh, project, for example, in the source code as well. So if you have a error message or something like that, you can search for it. Uh, and it, it will also search in the, uh, uh, AI package uh, files as well, if uh, of course they are not uh, runtime packages. And uh, yeah, you can just uh, go uh, to the uh, affected part. And yeah, I have some translation as well. And uh, also, if the customer is uh, present in the fields, you can also see them. Um, uh, there is a snapshot uh, view, which is a bit nicer view of the snapshot packages you can uh, create. Um, this is the call stack and uh, all the objects uh, that were affected uh, by this uh, snap or during this uh, snapshot uh, recording. So you can check whether an object that is uh, suspected to an issue, even if it was uh, hit uh, or not. And yeah, you can just navigate to it if you want to. Um, the latest uh, thing I created is uh, a complete uh, method list uh, for all of the workspace. <laughs> and um, I did this mainly because I was a bit lost uh, in the test libraries. Uh, so I can just uh, search uh, for anything and uh, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so for example, you can see if you want to, if you suspect you want to find something, but you don't know it uh, exactly, you can search for it and you can see that there is a create customer, not only for the sales part, but everywhere else. And uh, it makes it easier to discover uh, new code base and for me, mainly, mainly, the, uh, mainly the test libraries. I like you even more than before, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm guessing my time is uh, running out. Yeah, so, so if you have a last part. 
yeah so actually uh, yeah, i could go on for days uh, about this but uh, yeah for now i think i showed you uh, mostly anything i could uh, actually just uh, one last uh, thing uh, i have this scopes or bookmark uh, thing uh, you can uh, add uh, or create bookmarks uh, let's say in groups and uh, you can pinpoint methods, uh, publishers, objects uh, here, and uh, let's just say save it for later. And if you need it, you can bring it back. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is it uh, from me. <laughs> yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Im impressive, still uh, a lot of functionality. Uh, uh, of course, uh, as you said, it is uh, based upon AL Object Designer, and uh, a major part of this extension uh, you have this this licensing part. And so, uh, roughly, if I put it that way, but correct me, let's say the AL Object part uh, is is the, the the free part of the extension, and a lot of um, well, very uh, um, exquisite functionality or uh, worked out functionality is part of the licensing. Eh? Um, yes, the uh, free part contains this uh, AL home screen, the um, uh, workspace wizard as well, and all of the uh, navigation here to the source code. So uh, this part you can see in the list uh, are working also the um sidebars uh, are part of the community version and uh, all the graphical designers and the translation features uh, stuff uh, that is part of the premium stuff uh, uh, indeed uh, and if you go to uh, to the website uh, on the pricing page it's all detailed uh, what belongs where um, clear so. thank you very much Martin. there is no question um, attendees, so uh, I think uh, you can hand over to me and then I'm going to uh, uh, pick up the last okay. one for today. So, uh, thank you, Martin. And, and I, I've forgotten actually to say that, uh, yes, James' uh, uh, extension is about testing, running your test. Uh, there is a small part in Martin's extension. Uh, we don't have three extensions that fully uh, are dedicated to testing, but this one is also about testing. It's not uh, it's not about running tests. It's about uh, conceiving tests, creating tests. It's called ATDD Test Scripter. And uh, a short introduction on myself. A lot of things are falling around. I'm not the youngest anymore. This is my family. Been around in this world for quite a time, and I've been a tester at Microsoft, and that's my the main most important part here that, that let's say, infected me with uh, uh, that uh, DNA, you could say. Um, in when we started with the uh, um, series, sorry, the Ariopa webinars, uh, the second session I introduced uh, ATD Test Scripter. I had just uh, finished uh, my book, and based on the work I did for my book, I got into uh, uh, contact with Jan Hoek. Uh, can we automate a couple of things? Well, um, if you want to view that one, there's a link here, Getting Easily from Functional Test. Um, if you're on YouTube, on our channel, you will find it as the second video. Um, at that time, I, uh, um, let's say, demoed or talked about how can you get efficiently from a test definition, and then I'll get into some of the next slides to give some background on it, into test coding, because a lot of things are about doing exactly the same thing. And if that's the case, we can automate it. So a little bit about acceptance test-driven development. If you haven't been into it, uh, get to learn about it. I decided to focus on that one for a couple of reasons. Uh, there are different, as I call it, design patterns. You have four-phase testing. You have uh, the triple A for uh, um, unit tests. And ATDD is acceptance test driven development. It was conceived for, let's say, acceptance test, users test. Um, although the structure is always the same for any pattern you take. So you can use this also for unit tests. Uh, that I choose to take this one, two reasons. Microsoft standard tests mainly are written uh, from this concept. You could see in uh, the, the code that uh, James used 
in his demo, he was using also the given when then thing, although these are, is a, a let's say a kind of phrase given when then, but scenario and feature are part of that. Given this, uh, uh, and with a small example like this, you have a feature and a scenario for that feature that tests pub behavior. And that scenario has a couple of things to be set up before you can execute something. That's the when the given is uh, the, the given situation. And then eventually you're checking something. This is a scenario. The, the content is not that important. The only thing is I use this to show you this becomes code comments in code. And uh, from there, we're going to write the real code. Well, this step from getting from that uh, ATDD scenario into uh, this comments here, and you might not have noticed, but the, uh, the, the, the function name relates to the scenario. Although this example is not everything straightforward copied. So my given is not straightforwardly translatable into this function, but that's something uh, I, which I came across while I was writing the book. This given sentence can be exactly the name for my function. The when sentence could exactly be the name for my when function, etc. Yeah, so the helper function we're creating. So from here, having the given, having the when, having the then, we can automate a lot. We can create those uh, 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 a test function holding those comment lines, which I will I name in my book the customer wish. The, requirement into getting the first part of the black code in it. Yeah. So it's always like this. If you have a feature, you create a code unit. If you have a scenario, you create a test function. If you have this given when then is what I called write your test story, the, the black part. Eventually you need to get into those helper functions, some real code. I'm quickly going through it just as a background. I will demo this also. The problems uh, definition in this case was why do we want to build this tool is that uh, getting from that test definition into the first version of your code, having a code unit function, uh, uh, some content to, of the function is always the same. Copy paste, but as if, you, if you're doing that manually, it's error prone. And how do you find out that actually one given is the same in every others and makes use actually of or is uh, pointing to the same helper function? If you need an item, there will be a call to a create item function. And well, you might reuse that in the same context. Yeah. So consistently using the same things and consistently naming the same things. And um, solution is the ATTD test, test script. Well, a big jump, and this is the last slide in history. Two years ago, Jan Hook helped me to build a PowerShell module, which does a good job, and I'm still using it. And I was looking at the downloads and new downloads, more people are using it. However, that's one way you get the test definition and then uh, uh, create test code units having AL. Uh, Martin stepped in with actually a, a proposal to change something there, uh, sat down with uh, Jan and discussed uh, actually AL should be the truth. That's anything from getting test definitions in PowerShell scripts. I'm not going to bother you about that today, but uh, AL is the truth. We should be able to create that from test definitions and going back to test definitions. Well, at this moment, uh, Martin stepped in a year and a half ago, uh, and David Veldhoff, also present today, stepped in uh, around about a year ago. Uh, over last summer um, into fall, etc., we did a, a lot of work. The last couple of months, probably mainly due to my work on my book, I stopped a little bit, but I'm going to show you what it can do right now, because from the uh, PowerShell module, we start into creating a VS Code extension, and that's the demo where I, what I'm going to show you. So here I have uh, Visual Studio Code. I have a project, which is, by the way, our test project for our uh, uh, extension. Uh, we have a, a, a GitHub repo, like uh, many of the extensions have. By the way, this is the page of the extension itself. We're not at version one. We're still more or less at beta. We need to retest a couple of things, but 
partly uh, David is using it even more than I do. I think uh, we can we can do quite well with this thing, and well, uh, some others have been using it and testing it. But a final test, so it becomes version one, has not been done yet. That's the reason. Uh, you find all as all these things described, which I will demo. I think uh, maybe I'll demo even more, but I think it's quite complete. But if not, let us know. So back to the project. ATD test scripter, uh, to open it up, it shows a page uh, where it collects everything present, everything in the sense of test code units and their test into uh, an overview. And to uh, trigger that one, you have to just type ATDD.testScript or AT, whatever, what it finds, and execute this one. So, uh, this is now subtracting from all the code units present here, the tests, and based upon the ATDD, it uh, shows you that this test has a scenario name, it has a given, it has a when, it has a then. It's part of our test project, so it functionally there's not a lot of content in it, but it's about building a structure, because this code unit here has this function. Test yeah, and it. I clicked on scenario two, the ID two, and, and not on the hyperlink, but here. So it opens up this pane here, abstracting from the existing function the given when and then. And yes, uh, looking uh, and, and, and mocking a little bit to James, this is a, a little bit different way that James was applying, at least what I saw in his project. Um, I think testing is a functional thing. It's not a technical thing. Yes, in the end it is. So at this level, your given and your helper function show you, tell you the story. In my opinion, anybody who's been related to this, technical or less technical, who can debug, should be able to read it at this level. At least that's the given. So if you would open this up on James' project, misusing you a little bit, James, sorry for that, and uh, it will not abstract things uh, maybe as well as you might expect. So the assumption is that your tests do have a, a given tag, a when tag, etc. And from here, have a look, I could say, well, I need a new given. And then you might get into problem if you don't have functions well defined, but it creates a new given line and it creates a new helper function by default. And this level, this is where the real coding comes around. Uh, but then the tool inserts an error, which you get overruled by a setting that it doesn't insert it anymore. But as soon as you're going to deploy this, you do already have ready code. Yeah? So if we go into the client and uh, uh, already deployed it and have a, uh, a look at uh, from the AL test tool, Sorry, okay, uh, test tool. If you have been using it, you can uh, you know that you can get code units from your application uh, being test code units and insert them into your tool and run the test. If we run the test, you will see that all tests fail because of, well, in this case, the first valid given, uh, create valid given uh, helper function already has this error in it. But Technically, it's okay. You can start doing your work right now. So you could go and now uh, uh, get this one implemented step by step, and then you check out of givens working. Is the one working? Is my verification working? So um, at this moment, the tool allows you two things. You can start from scratch, and I'll show you that too, or you can start with a existing project and abstract your tests to this level and then uh, let's say manage it. Okay, I need an extra given. And so it inserts the given, it creates the helper function for you. Uh, you can also say, well, I don't need this one. And so if you have an existing test and something is too much or whatever, you can remove it. It can ask you, do you want to also uh, remove that uh, helper function. So from this level, you can have an abstraction. You are at an abstract, abstraction level where you can manage your tests. Yeah. Um, if you're standing on this line, you could say, I need to add 
a new scenario. Yeah? And it will already insert the scenario. Uh, given a, a setting, it will uh, insert an initialize function. I'm going to discuss that. But then now I can start to say, okay, I need a given one, right? I need a given two. And uh, uh, this allows me to, uh, let's say, define my test at this level. Yeah? I need a when, and there's only one when. We deliberately did that. If you have two whens, you're actually doing two actions. Uh, a test should only verify one action. If it needs to verify multiple actions, you have a separate test checking that one. And, uh, um, and then a follow-up test that takes that previous one, maybe as, as a, uh, the data from the previous one, or your new test will first create all that data. Well, whatever. Yeah, so you can continue doing this. Uh, you can even go and type things here and will be updated in the other page, although sometimes the syncing is not working uh, straightforward. That's, uh, often it works and sometimes it's not, so I'm not going to show that right now. If you're on this line here and you want to uh, uh, add a, a scenario, it's like this. But you could also say, wait, I need a new uh, feature and now I need to about this one here. So I'm here and I wait. Uh, here, features at this level, excuse me, that's why I made it uh, uh, close the other window. And I can say I need a new feature. Yeah, and then it will create for me a, uh, here, a new feature, you can see, which is now a new test code unit containing that feature. By default, it's like a feature is a test code unit. You could have tests, test code units containing multiple features, like this example. Yeah. So this code unit has multiple features. That's not a setting if you create a new, but it can handle it. And if you say, I want to remove that feature, feature two or feature one, it will then update your code unit and only feature two is left. Yeah. So you can manage all ways yeah. So create a new, as I just showed you, handle the existing ones, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's the status at this moment. And as you can see from the upper bar here, we uh, are going to provide the possibility to run the test, actually hooking into James AL Test Runner. We're not going to build something new. We're definitely making use of something which has proven to be working well. Um, and, and that's for version two, um, and that's the ultimate goal. AL code, if you have your tests in place and your project is delivered, then that AL code is reflecting what your uh, feature is doing, what your app code is doing. Yeah? So uh, you could say your tests are the description of the functionality. Uh, your requirements and other kind of functional documents tend to get out of sync with that. So if you want to do a next update to this app, including the test, you're going to abstract something from your test. So we will make it possible that you can export it to an ATDD sheet. And an ATDD sheet, you might know it from uh, my book or some other kind of combinations. So that for, this is, by the way, the ATDD sheet for our project here. Uh, but that looks like this. Yeah, so if I open up this and zoom in a little bit, so at this level, ATDD sheet is like this, a feature, scenario, given when then, and some extra description if you want, of course, if given and then, but here some notes, and then every scenario gets uh, an ID to. Um, the whole flow in the future should be, somebody creates for a new functionality, uh, uh, a given when then, sheet, an ATDD sheet, you're able to import that with the AL, uh, uh, so the uh, ATDD test scripter, uh, VS Code extension, it will then create uh, the AL code, the test code units and the tests in it. And then later on, you would be able, if needed, to abstract it again for an update into this sheet and then uh, update from the sheet again into AL. Yeah? So that round, it's now 
only working internally, you could say, on your project, having an overview, adding things to it, removing things from it, adding details, adding new features, etc. That's the status at this moment. Okay. Um, uh, it was at great speed. I think I made it in time well enough. Um, so if there are any questions, feel free to step in. I didn't see anyone in the list, but uh, uh, that's what I wanted to show. No questions, um, then I think we're going to round up. Of course, with any uh, question, um, of, sorry, with any extension, <laughs> mingling up words, uh, you know where to find uh, the, the, the background information that applies to mine, that applies to uh, James' extension, that apply, I have disabled it because uh, starting up VS Code and AL Studio takes a little bit while and if I needed to restart it, I didn't want to bother you with a lot of time. So you will always find information and can click here on the link going to the uh, marketplace and there you will find the repo that goes with it, that applies to James. Uh, Martin's and mine extension. And by the way, I call it mine right now, but really Martin and David uh, did a, a great work on it also. Uh, so uh, this is a joint project. Okay, we're getting close to the hour. Uh, I see a couple of uh, uh, things like uh, great stuff. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, uh, Chot Todd writes, was the import of the ATP sheet a current feature? No, it's not yet. Uh, so we focused on getting this working on um, on VS Code because uh, getting that other one, uh, well, I'll let this was a challenge enough, but getting the, the export, the import working was a, another challenge. And by the way, the workaround for that is that you use the uh, uh, ATDD PowerShell module uh, that uh, uh, in the ATDD sheet, not in this one, but in the ones I'm using for really working on AL code, there is a column where it's PowerShell converted and then you can use the tool to create a, a code from that one. So having that work around is, uh, uh, is uh, let's say, uh, a solution to that. Arthur is saying, I'm going to try the test runner from James. So James, uh, we've got found one person more to use it and then we need to find more. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy says, a reminder, developers can put recommended extensions in their workspace, yes, uh, uh, and uh, get their co-workers going on some of them. Thank you very much. And David Singleton remarks, there's really a lot of to take in with all the AL extensions, yeah. Uh, and I know, David, that you're going to go through all the recording and maybe he'll have a kind of summary in one of the next uh, Ariopa sessions. So. Um, James, uh, Martin, thank you very much for being part of this. Uh, thanks for everybody else for attending and uh, spread the word because we're helping each other by showing this, by using this, by suggesting improvement. So uh, be welcome to do that. I'm going to uh, close by showing our final slide. Thank you. And uh, any way of communicating with us, you find right here. Thank you.